what's up. Great. Over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I was quite excited in the beginning because there was only about four or five people there. I thought this is great. Um, and now suddenly it's got a bit fuller and I can see some people have come here and they want to ask difficult questions. So, um, But I think it's always an opportunity to, when you get a chance to present on something. And when I originally put this abstract in, uh, I'll be honest, it was actually just a way to motivate to attend this conference to KZ and Wildlife. In case they, they asked any questions, and then suddenly, I, when it was accepted, I thought, shucks, I've actually got to do some work now. But it does always give you an opportunity to reflect on what you do and actually evaluate your own performance and, and actually are you making a success and, and making a difference in work. So I originally titled it, you know, the buzzword for about the past three or four years has all been about partnerships and. And we all know that they're really important, but do they actually work? Are they working and can they work? And so I want to tell you first what this presentation is not. Um, so basically, it's not a critique about current conservation partnerships so that people want to come here and, and start boxing. I'm not here to, to, to be critical or anything, but rather a reflection of, of what's out there, what's working, what hasn't worked, what can work. And I'm not going to tell you to how a partnership can be successful. If we just look at how many books are written on successful marriages over the last 10 or 15 years and that the divorce rate keeps going up, something's not right there. There's more books on how to make your marriage work, but there's more divorces. So I'm not here to tell you, well, this is what's going to make your partnership successful. But it will, however, help you to encourage to evaluate what partnerships there are um, and how they can be strengthened. And, and that can be done through some key indicators of what makes successful partnerships some of the lessons that, it, that have been learnt along the way, and also personal experience, what I've experienced in my, my con uh, conservation uh, background, and then basically how new partnerships can survive. So we heard earlier on from Andy that we've got to basically go back to the beginning and look at the definitions. I didn't go to Wiki Answers. Um, I went to Wikipedia and the Oxford English Dictionary Online. You don't even need to have a dictionary on the shelf anymore. And it basically defines a partnership as, as the state of being be, uh, between persons or bodies with a joint interest or association. And I highlighted joint interest because I think that's what is basically going to be critical in any partnership. There has to be some interest, a joint interest for to succeed at the end. And hopefully through the presentation I'll just um, highlight that and just keep, bear that in mind. It's a, a joint interest where the outcome should be more effective than a single party working alone. Pretty much speaks for itself. You can achieve more by being in a partnership than if you were doing it on your own. Where there's risks and benefits for all parties, as opposed to a relationship where often one party benefits more than the other. So in a, in a partnership, you have equal risks and equal benefits. However, for conservation partnerships, the ultimate beneficiary should be biodiversity and not the individual organizations that are involved in the partnership. Um, and that's often sometimes very difficult to evaluate because you're normally evaluating how successful you've been as an organization in that partnership as opposed to actually the benefit to biodiversity. And many of your partnerships result, result is the scope of the work being too much, the resources that are required to achieve that um, through finances, people, vehicles, and that's often why partnerships evolve and are established. So looking at some of these benefits and risks um, of, of partnerships, the benefits are obviously self-explanatory. We can look at combining complementary skills, so bringing a wide range of skills together to achieve a lot more. Accessing local knowledge and experience. Often we don't, aren't on the ground all the time. We need to access what is available and getting down, especially when it comes to communities, getting into the communities, understanding the dynamics of those communities. Building capacity, we've heard in our previous uh, talks today about building the capacity of the local communities and then also gaining local acceptance and legitimacy, that people will actually see that it's not a fly by night, that it's something that's going to provide employment opportunities or, or, and the likes. But there's also risks with that. There's a strain on existing resources. The, the resources are finite and the, when you enter into partnerships, there's now expectations that are required. Uh, are seen and that then puts a strain on your, your resources. And with that often comes the failure to meet commitments. We often see, especially in high level partnerships, organizations sign these things and that gets filtered down to the staff who then sometimes aren't able to meet those commitments and that has, 
is a risk to the partnership, a risk to the organizations, and there's also differing priorities. And the one that I think that we often overlook is the changes in personnel. Is there's no succession planning in these partnerships. They're often driven by personalities. Suddenly those people leave. There's no succession planning and often partnerships stumble and fall. So in KZN we've seen a whole number of partnerships being established. And, and one that I, the three that I'd really like to talk about is ones that I've been involved with and had some interaction with. And the first one is Esmvelos, and I put it extension function, but that's basically uh, our partnerships and outreach outside of our protected area, how we work outside of the formerly protected areas. Um, and then the ROE working group and the Blue Swallow working group, and there's representatives of both those here today. So hopefully I don't stand on any toes or anything like that. But as I said, it's a reflection, not a critique. KZN Wildlife, the previous Natal Parks Board, um, has had a long history of engaging with private landowners. Um, in the Natal Parks Board, taking the history of the country into account, <coughs> they focus purely on the white landowner and commercial, commercial agriculture, commercial forestry, and really that was the focus of the extension function for the then Natal Parks Board, and that kind of then kind of evolved as KZN Wildlife came into being. And slowly we started to realize that we need to start engaging with our rural community. So for about the past 10 years we've had either DCOs um, or community conservation officers basically going out there to kind of form some kind of partnership to engage with either your private landowner or your rural community. Unfortunately a lot of this is, and, and going out there and taking that message out there has relied on the landowner's goodwill to conserve biodiversity. There was no formal mechanisms in place until the last maybe five or six years to ensure that that biodiversity conservation actually took place. So we basically saw the landowners as recipients of awareness as opposed to partners in conservation. We were out there to raise awareness, raise the profile of biodiversity, as actually instead of bringing them on board and actually making them actively contribute to biodiversity conservation. I've said it was more about building relationships. DCOs and CCOs were placed out in the communities, told to get, become a part of the community. If you go to farmers' sale yards, go to the local pub, however you felt best to engage with those, those communities that you were there targeting, you were told to get involved. And so you basically started to build relationships, as opposed to actually bringing the landowners, the communities on board, so they actually had to contribute something. And one of the weaknesses is staff worked in the areas where they felt comfortable. They kind of targeted landowners that they could get along with or and avoided areas where you knew that there was going to be potential conflict. And that was definitely one of the downfalls, is that you kind of worked in a comfort zone and you kind of just meandered your way through the whole process. And for those of you, our, our districts, conservation districts are fairly large. So you can be, do a whole lot of work working in your comfort zone fairly easily. And so we really kind of fell short a little bit there. So I kind of put this little, little model together quickly. Is basically we had the conservation authority working out there, the DCOs, the CCOs, who would be forming little workings with uh, NGOs and stuff to get out, take the message out there. But they kind of boxed the landowner and the community into their own little thing and said, right, you're the recipients, this is where we're going, and we're going to come and tell you how to do things with the hope and expectation that the biodiversity would be protected. But the kudos would go back to the conservation authority and the NGO and nothing to do with the landowner or the community. And that's the model that we've kind of been using and, and repeating for a number of years now. And so looking at that, we know that that doesn't work because we see that that goodwill has fallen by the wayside because the economics, the drivers in the economy have changed. And goodwill doesn't pay the bank loan, it doesn't pay for fertilizer and the likes. So we know something like that doesn't work anymore. And I'll go on to the, how we beat that just now. Then we lo I looked at the Blue Swallow Working Group. It was a working group that was uh, created to basically conserve the Blue Swallow. With some of um, going out there and saying how can we save this critically endangered bird species. Some of the shortcomings is the landowner was really seen there as to give permission to monitor the birds. You kind of went to the landowner, we want to monitor the and he said, yeah, or she, yeah, no, sure, go. They never really felt part of the process. And the reason for that is they were never defined, so say, this is actually what we require of the landowner. 
we kind of just thought we're going to go out there and we'll tell, as long as we're telling the landowner, giving a bit of feedback, but we never said what was wanted of that landowner. And so there was no clearly defined goal. How are we going to ensure that the landowner feels a part of this Blue Swallow working group? And the landowner, the relationships were merely superficial. It was kind of, hi, how are you? Yeah, no, talk a little bit about the birds, go see what's happening, and that was about it. And ultimately, it was personality driven with personal agendas. And as people changed, staff moved on, people left the organizations that were involved, the group slowly dwindled basically to almost nothing. Where at one stage, kind of no one really knew what the Blue Swallow Working Group was all about. The next one, I'm going to have to speed up a bit here, was the Oribe Working Group, also established in KZN as a result of the declining Oribe populations. <coughs> but they had some successes. They included the landowners, and I've called it the enemy from the word go. They got on the corporate forestry sector, got them involved in the committee, got them involved in the working group, kind of brought them on sides from the word go. Instead of just seeing them as recipients awareness, they were seen as part of the solutions to the declining Oribe populations. And they then worked as a group to tackle the problem. So basically looked at ways to address illegal hunting, habitat destruction and the like. So worked collectively. Instead of it being just the conservation sectors, they brought on the, the enemy and the landowners. But some of the shortcomings is... They failed to include rural communities from the outset, and it's only recently we've started to look at bringing on emerging landowners into the whole dynamic of the Oribe Working Group. And we once again saw them as an audience to on the receiving end in, instead of a partner. So there's some generally some common themes that we can see here coming out of these partnerships. One, landowners, communities are seen as recipients, not as partners. They're not brought in to be part of the process. Personal agendas are the key driving force. And it's one of the things that we often see in partnerships. It's people have got their own agendas, their own egos, which keep these things going. They leave or, or no longer interested, things start to fall apart. Continuity of staff and personnel. People in KZN and Wildlife will know too well that if a DCO leaves, it takes anything from a year to 18 months to replace that person. There's now a void left in the community. People don't know where to go to. And the new person that comes along has to restart all the going from scratch. Goals are not clearly defined. And the key one is there's no socioeconomic component. We saw earlier on Etiquini have identified that as a strong issue that needs to be identified. And a lot of those things we never really looked at. So what is needed to succeed to make a partnership successful? One, you need to define your goals and make them achievable. Those things down. Often we think it's just about RB conservation. No. What is required of each and every person? Um, what are the threats? What are the things? How can we address those? Which new partners do we need to bring on board? Effective communication. How do you communicate effectively? Keep getting that message out there. Um, identifying benefits. We've, we've seen that ecosystem goods and services is a major theme now. And we, consumers are becoming more eco aware. So that's one of the ways of partnerships, relaying those benefits back to the landowner. And then one size does not fit all. I'm going to have to speed up a bit here. So you can't just take a model and think it's going to work wherever. You've got to mold your model to the kind of people. And then some of the things, transparency, openness and trust. Be open and honest. Equitability, equal, a right to be heard. People each need to make an equal contribution. One party partner can't give more than the other. And then there must be mutual benefits, benefits to all, which must continue even if the partnership dissolves. We've seen in the ESCAM EWT partnership, if the EWT dissolved that, a lot of the things that have been put in place in ESCAM would continue, the way they monitor their power lines and stuff. So you've got to, those benefits must carry on even if a partnership dissolves. Um, and it must be bigger than the individuals, and you need to define the role of the organization. Um, no, almost finished now. Um, so just one of the key things is obviously forming partners with landowners. We need to appreciate the historical landscape of, of South Africa. We can't, we can't deny that. And that basically means who you engage with determine how you engage. We have a community, we, we're still divided in this country in terms of this communal land and private landowners. Communal land, you've got to go from the bottom up as well as from the top down. So engaging those uh, traditional authority as well as the people on the ground. So approaching it from both aspects, and then understanding the cultural anomalies and bringing that into place. In private landowners, often it's about forming relationships with the individual landowners, but then forming partnerships with things like um, farmers associations, 
who then can take that message down to their membership base. They can then help to rectify the relationship between conservation and agriculture, which has sometimes deteriorated over the years. So using the, the bodies as partners and the relationships with private landowners. And then lastly, the socio-economic partners. People's livelihoods are at stake. We see everything keep going up and up and up and up. Um, and in order for us to do that, there's got to be some benefit. We've got to be bringing these people on that it's not just about the bookies, but there is some um, benefit to people about why they want to conserve. Conservation bodies don't possess these skills, and I don't really see why we should possess those skills when there's far better suited people out there that we need to tap in and harness and bring in. Things like local and district municipalities, um, non-conservation NGOs, we need to start partnering with them to bring those skills on board. The problem is, is that we've got the various partners that we want and the one in red is the one that we fear the most as conservationists because we don't understand the dynamics of the social issues. And those are the people that we need to bring in place so that basically it will come in and often we bring them in and then we let them go and we bring them in and we let them go. We need to create strategies to make sure that they come in and I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. I think nobody would have anticipated 10 years ago that a DCO would deliver such a presentation. And I, it, it demonstrates to me there's hope and we can learn. <laughs> Questions for Brent? You're blown away. I'm like, this has got to go into our